Amen. Yes, sir. If you have your Bible, if you turn to the book of Matthew chapter 15 with me tonight, please. Matthew chapter 15. Verse number 21. Matthew chapter 15, verse 21. Then Jesus went thence into part of the coast of Tyre and Sidon. And behold, a woman of Canaan came out of the same coast, cried to him, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, thou son of David. My daughter is grievously vexed with the devil, but he answered her not a word. And his disciples came and besought him, saying, Send her away, for she crieth after us. But he answered and said, I am not sent but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Then came she and worshipped him, saying, Lord, help me. But he answered and said, It is not meet to take the children's bread and cast it to dogs. And she said, Truth, Lord, yet the dogs eat of the crumbs which fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered and said unto her, O woman, Great is thy faith, be it unto thee even as thou wilt. And her daughter was made whole from that very hour. Lord bless this holy book. Amen. When we get Sunday night's message, Lucas preached a very good message using this, con using this text and others about worshiping God. Amen. And uh, I, would, I would highly recommend that you, uh, that you listen to that message. My approach to it tonight is entirely different. It has nothing to do with worship, but it has to do with um, opening up the study of the New Testament. It's important to understand that. How many of you have ever heard of Ethelbert Bullinger? All right. He has what's called a companion Bible. Uh, I do not agree with everything that Brother Bullinger says in his Bible. I've got, I've got at least two of them, and maybe three. But... He has some outstanding notes. He has notes that you will not find anywhere else. And in order to put this in context, this woman being called a dog, how do you, how do, you do this? You get on the internet and, and YouTube it, you know, do some research into what people say. You'll hear everything in the world. And I've yet to read any of them that have, any, that have a clue as to what's really going on except Bullinger. Bullinger. Bullinger goes back to Isaiah chapter 6. Okay, now I'm giving my source material tonight. <laughs> you know, learn where to study, what to read. One of the things they taught me in school was that you don't learn everything in school, but you learn how to find stuff. And uh, there's a great deal of truth in that. You learn how to find it. And Bullinger's notes on Isaiah chapter number 6 are outstanding. And the reason they are is because it sets the New Testament in context to where it makes sense. He explains why in one place you turn the cheek and the other place you buy a sword. He explains why this Syrophoenician woman from Tyre and Sidon was turned away and called a dog. And then later on, something entirely different happens. I want you to notice what he says in Matthew chapter number 10, verse 5. He sent these twelve forth and commanded them, saying, Go not into the way of the Gentiles, and into any city of the Samaritans enter you not. See that? That's in Matthew chapter 10 and verse number 5. Do not go into any city of the Samaritans. Yet in John chapter number 4 and verse number 4 we read, And he must needs go through Samaria. <coughs> now, if you don't believe the Bible, you'll say, well, this is a contradiction. No, it's no contradiction. <clears throat> you see, the, here's what happens. When you find things like that that may appear to contradict, dig a little deeper and pray over it, and you may be in the business of learning something. God's going to show you something. Amen. Because uh, I'm a Bible believer. It's not my place to critique the Bible. Just read it and believe it. Amen. And I certainly do. I believe it. And, and like, uh, like Mark Twain says, he says, it's not the things in the Bible that I don't understand that bother me. It's the stuff in there that I do understand. Samuel Clemens, you know, Mark Twain. Yes, sir. 
And he had a way with words, no question about that. Whether or not he ever knew the Lord or not, that's, I don't know. That's, I don't know that much about his life. But I fully agree with what he said. Yeah, it's not the, it's not the ambiguity, as you might say, of the Bible. It is what you do understand. And this is what we get into tonight. You see, he told her, you're a dog. All right, now, goyim today is a term used by the Jews in reference to the uh, Gentiles. You are seeing manifested before your very eyes the worst case of Jew hatred that I have ever seen in my lifetime. I've never seen anything like this. And the last uh, figure I saw was something like 85 colleges and universities in this country now have, have, have joined up with this movement and they are condemning Jews. And uh, you know, this is quite a thing. It's not just something that happens. There's reason for all of this. And, uh, but in any event, that's not what we're talking about tonight, but I just want you to keep in mind, uh, how many has ever heard of Kristallnacht? Kristallnacht, that's a German word. That's the night of the broken glass. That's when it became obvious that Germany was out to get the Jew. They put across the window of their, of their little shops, Juden, Jew. And any Jew that was smart in Germany would be leaving that country immediately. I think this was 1939, 38, somewhere in there. But uh, there's, there's an issue going on. So he called her a dog. Now, you know, that's a humiliating thing. It's a humiliating thing. And he said to her, you have no right at all to, uh, to the ministry. Now, if you, had been, if you had come to the Lord and that's the answer that you got, and you turned away and walked away and never, uh, never heard another word from the Lord, what would you think? Or let's take it another step. Let's say, for example, you know, the Bible, when it, the books were written of the Bible, they weren't put together until the first century. And then you have what's called a canon of Scripture, and you have all the books of the Bible put together in New Testament books. Until then, and more than likely so, most New Testament Christians of the first century only had a few books. Some of them maybe just one. And what if you had uh, the Gospel of uh, Matthew and uh, the 15th chapters as far as it went? Let's say you only had a portion of it. And let's say you read through the first 15 chapters of the book of Matthew, got to this point, and, uh, and, and you're a Gentile, and you read that, what would you think? What would you think? He said, you're a dog. Get away. Leave. His disciples said, leave. You have no part in this. And that's all you had. You see, it's so easy today to look back in retrospect upon something that we ta we've taken for granted. We've got a completed canon, the canon of Scripture, all 66 books, the 27 in the New Testament. They've been settled for a long time. And uh, how do you explain that? That's important because it opens up to us tonight the mind of God. Because if you'll notice, please, when she called upon him and pleaded his genealogy, son of David, that had absolutely nothing to do with her relationship with him. Now, if you'd been a Jew, it'd been a different story because the first chapter of the Gospel of Matthew goes into his genealogy, and he is the son of David. But Matthew is also the Gospel of the Kingdom of Heaven. It's the Gospel that has to do with the Jew. It's directed toward the Jew. Now, the Gospel of John is directed toward all who will believe, Jew or Gentile. Now, in Matthew chapter number 7, and verse number 6, here's what it says. Give not that which is holy unto the dogs, Neither cast ye your pearls before swine, lest they trample them under your feet, under their feet rather, and turn again and rend you. That's quite a statement, don't you think? This is Matthew chapter 7. Before he said this, chapter 15. Now what are you talking about? Who's the dog? Well, he just called her a dog. In Matthew chapter 15, Gentile dog. You know, a lot of churches today wouldn't preach this. They like, the, they like the, the Beatitudes and the Sermon on the Mount and be good and feel gooey, feel warm, goosebumps and, you know, cold chills up and down your spine and, and go out and have a good time and all that. That's what you get out of most churches today. The church in America is a sick, sick uh, representation of, uh, I call it this phony religion. They try to call it uh, Christianity. It's not. It's a phony religion, as phony as it can be. Now, the apostle says in Philippians chapter number 3 and verse 2, beware of dogs, beware of evil workers, beware of the concision. 
Now, who would that be, would you think? That's Jews. For we are the circumcision which worship God in the spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. When I was in Cairo, Egypt, I had the great fortune to go into the museum in Cairo. And uh, I saw things in there that I had never read about. W did you, were you at that museum? And uh, that was one of the days on a tour that I got so mad I couldn't stand it. And the reason is they only gave us a few minutes in that museum and herded us out and took us off to some nothing place and said, well, you can buy photographs of it. That's not what I wanted. I was in the museum. I was looking at it firsthand. And folks, now let me tell you something. I saw things in that museum that I had never read about, had never seen, and it kind of put a different spin on a lot of the stuff that you hear coming out of the pulpit today. I know what I'm talking about. I was there and saw it firsthand. And the museum in Cairo, Egypt, is, stands with, I'd say, within the top ten of the whole world because you're talking about a nation with displaying their own stuff. And Egypt to this day is uh, trying their best to get a lot of their stuff back and one of them is the British Museum, who the Brits have carried off an awful lot of stuff. The British Museum is one of the, is, is one of the most uh, well-known museums in the world. I saw things, folks. I learned things. I, I observe. <laughs> uh, that's about as much as I'll get into and all that, but I'm going to tell you something right now. Uh, uh, ignorance is bliss for a lot of people, and, and they build their theology and their doctrine on ignorance. Don't ever do that. Uh, ask God to give you wisdom. Ask him to show you. Because there's an awful lot out there, folks, that we don't hear about here. We, we, somebody said one time, said the preacher is one of the preacher's worst faults is they listen to each other too much. <laughs> there's probably a lot of truth in that. <laughs> the preachers listen to the preachers too much. So beware of dogs, the apostle said. Now in 2 Peter chapter number 2, verse 19, but it has happened unto them according to the true proverb, the dog is turned to his own vomit again, and the sow that was washed to her wallowing in the mire. So as I've said to you many times before, the, the, the dogs of the East, especially in this area, ran in packs, and they were not your American pooch, your friend, you know, your pet and all that. Now, many of you probably have pet dogs. That's all fine. That's all well and good. No problem. Our Lord only knows how many old stray dogs that my brother and I took in when we were kids. Back when we were kids, folks, the roads were full of stray dogs. They were everywhere. And if you'd feed one, you had a dog <laughs> from then on. And I didn't know what a veterinarian was. We didn't have any money to take dogs to vets. It's all we could do to go to, go to the doctor. You know, things have changed a lot. But so we, I grew up with a good old dog. And, uh, but in the Bible, the dog is never, ever set in a good context. It's used as a derisive term to tear down and destroy so what's going, what's going on? One minute he says, you cannot go in the way of the Samaritans. And the next minute he says, we must needs go through Samaria. Well, obviously something changes. This is how you study the Bible. Something has changed from the original, you know, prohibition. Do not go into the way of the Samaritans. It's not meat to take the children's food and give it to dogs and then turn right around. And look at Matthew, John chapter number four, rather. The nobleman said unto him, Sir, come down ere my child die. Jesus saith unto him, Go thy way, thy son liveth. So it's changed completely. And he's going to the, uh, he's going to the Gentiles. If you remember when Simeon, Simeon held that little baby in his arms, he said, This is the salvation. Mine eyes have seen the salvation of the Lord. A light to lighten the what? The Gentiles. Yes, sir. A light to lighten the Gentiles. But it was like the Apostle Peter, who had never been in a Gentile house, and the Lord told him to go to the house of Cornelius. And Peter said, no, Lord, let me straighten you up on this thing here. We've got a problem going on. <laughs> uh, I haven't been in, and he said, don't you call unclean what I've cleaned. So most people would have turned away, if that's all the Bible they had, and they would have walked off angry toward God and said, well, if that's what he thinks about me, I'm done with him. But that's not, uh, you gotta, you got to understand, you have to take everything that the Bible says about a subject, read everything it has to say about that subject before you come to a conclusion. 
Get it in context. Get it throughout the theme as it runs through the entire Bible. And then remember this. Sometimes the Bible does not say everything that has to or could be said about that subject. You've got what the Bible says. You know everything the Bible says. But what the Bible says may not be everything that can be said about that subject. And one of the reasons is because it's not finished yet. We're not there yet. There's yet, there's, there's more to come. So you've got to keep that in mind. In Matthew chapter number 13 and verse number 10, the disciples came and said to him, Why speakest thou unto them in parables? That's a good question. Why do you, why do, you do that? Why do you speak to them in parables? Well, he had a reason for that. He had a reason for that. Because these leaders of the Jews had had a meeting. Look at Matthew chapter number 12 and verse 14. Matthew chapter number 12 and verse number 14. They'd held a council, verse 14. The Pharisees went out and held a council against him, how they might destroy him. And note what follows. And in his name shall the Gentiles trust. Now look what happens. The moment the Lord Jesus Christ says that they have gone out to destroy this is what they had chosen to do. They're going to destroy me, he says. And in his name shall the Gentiles trust. Now we're taking, you're seeing the changeover. You're seeing it from changing over from the Jew only to the Jew and Gentile. And once it does, once it changes over to Jew and Gentile, it's no longer about a nation. It's about all mankind. See that? Now that's, that's the way it goes. It's no longer about the kingdom of heaven for a nation. Now it's the gospel of the grace of God for all mankind, for any, for whosoever will. Now, he said to them in Matthew chapter 13, when they ask, why speakest thou to us in prophet, or to, to them in parables? Matthew 13, verse 10, he said to them, because it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it is not given. So now something is happening to the Jew since he has taken away the offer of the kingdom of heaven to them and says now the Gentiles are going to be saved. Something is happening to the Jew. And here's what's happening. He's blinding them. And he does it through the parable. Now listen carefully. This is a gracious thing. This is a merciful thing. Okay? Now here's what he says to the leadership of his day. This is where the unpardonable sin comes in and I had so many requests uh, on the internet when I mentioned the unpardonable sin people are interested in things like that they want to know I've sinned can my sin be forgiven see well now we're looking at the leadership of Israel and we're reading where it says they held a council how they might destroy him they had already made up their mind. It doesn't make any difference how many miracles you perform. It doesn't matter what you say. It doesn't matter how many people follow you. We are going to destroy you. And that is what came forth from the Pharisees and the leadership of Israel. And this is where the dire warning comes in in Matthew chapter number 12 and verse 31. He said, I say unto you, all manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men. But the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven unto men. And whosoever speaketh a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But whosoever speaketh against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven him, neither in this world, neither in the world to come. Now here's a couple of things to look at very carefully with this. Number one, if the Holy Spirit is not present, you cannot blaspheme him. All right, that's simple. You can't do it. That means that a pagan in the darkest parts of this world that has never heard the gospel cannot blaspheme the Holy Ghost. He can't do it. On the other hand, that one that comes to church every time the church doors are opened and you've been flooded with light all of your life and you have created for yourself your own phony Christian religion, now, I'm not saying the faith of Christ is phony, but there is a phony Christian religion. And you get around people who it's their culture 
you're going to get around people that I'm talking about who know what I'm talking about. You have rejected and rejected and rejected and rejected the moving of the Holy Spirit in your life, convicting and convincing you that Christ came and died for you. Then, my dear friend, if you reject the Holy Spirit, all right, you reject the Holy Spirit, what is left to you to bring you to God? Is there anything left for you to bring you to God? Well, of course not. There's no higher authority than the Holy Ghost. And so these leaders in that day were, were on the verge, were vulnerable for, to commit the unpardonable sin. And he says, if you die like this, there's no forgiveness here and there's no forgiveness in the world to come because you have blasphemed the Holy Ghost. Now, did the Apostle Paul speak against Christ? Why, well, sure he did. Did he speak against him? Absolutely. Yes, he did. This is, this is so important. He spoke against him. He was headed to Damascus with letters to bound to, to those of that way to carry him back to Jerusalem, have him stoned to death. He did all of that. But he did not blaspheme the Holy Ghost. He didn't meet the Holy Ghost till the road to Damascus. That's when the Holy Spirit came upon Saul of Tarsus. And that's when he came face to face with his maker. And that's when he had to make a choice. Who is it, Lord? <laughs> I am Jesus whom you persecute. Why persecutest thou me? And so when he came face to face with him, he received the witness of the Holy Spirit of God as to who he was, and he received him. That's right. Here's what he said about that. He said, I was injurious. You remember I preached to the youth past Sunday, that word? You know? Hubris. Hubris. I forget the three syllables involved in it. But we get the English word hubris. Arrogant. You know. A, a kind of person who takes pleasure in putting, in inflicting pain on someone. Paul said, I was like that. I inflicted pain on people. And I enjoyed it. But he still had not committed the, whole, the, the unpardonable sin. He hadn't committed it. Here's what he said. He said, because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. Now, folks, that doesn't get any more important than what I just gave you. That's important. That's very important. He said, I did it ignorantly in unbelief. Therefore, I obtained mercy. You know what I mean? That's something, isn't it? It really is. Isn't it amazing how the Bible compliments itself? It's quite, quite a remarkable thing. Now, some folks out there say if you say something about speaking in tongues, you've committed the unpardonable sin, this, that, this, that, this, that, this, that. And no doubt a lot of good people out there and all that. But my dear friend, nothing could be, you're as far as the east is from the west, from the truth. That has nothing to do with the unpardonable sin. The unpardonable sin has to do with you and the Holy Ghost. You see, you can speak a word against Christ. Paul did. He spoke against him. He preached against him. He said everything he could say against him. But he was ignorant in unbelief. See the difference? How many of you following with me tonight and understand how important what I just said is? That's important. It really is. I mean, that's a watershed. That, that's, that's, that's important to get a hold of a concept like that because that makes all the difference in the world. Now, do you remember what I said about, uh, about Ethelbert Bullinger? If you get his notes, now if you've got Logos, how many may have a Bible program? You use a computer to study the Bible? Logos has Bullinger's uh, companion Bible, electronic forms. It makes it, it, makes it easy to, uh, a lot easier to, to get through it. But then the sixth chapter of Isaiah, okay, the sixth chapter of Isaiah, the king, he starts out in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and lifted up. Well, Uzziah was a leprous king. He crossed the threshold. Though he were the monarch, he still had no right to enter into the holy place where a priest, only a priest, could enter. And when he did, he was smitten with leprosy right on the spot. It was just like, you remember uh, 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 Moses' sister Aaron, uh, 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 Miriam? Remember what happened to her? Same thing. Right on the spot, smitten with leprosy. And he kept it, he had it till the day he died. And so we have a contrast in the sixth chapter of Isaiah between a leprous king 
and one that is high and lifted up. And the one high and lifted up is the Lord Jesus Christ in his glory. See, we, say, we get pictures of that like in the book of Daniel, the ancient of days in his glory, when he's manifesting his glory. And one day, all creation is going to see that glory. They're going to see it. They'll know, they'll see him as he is. Yes, sir, they'll glorify him. In the name of Jesus, every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that he's Lord to the glory of God the Father. But now Bullinger, Bullinger goes a step further. And it's quite remarkable if you follow with me tonight. Look at Matthew chapter 13 and verse number 14. Matthew chapter 13 and verse number 14. He says that scripture in the book of Isaiah chapter number 6 is quoted seven times in the New Testament where they have ears to hear and they hear not, eyes to see and they see not, their heart is darkened or hardened. That's quoted seven times and it is applied. The Holy Spirit applies every time the Old Testament is quoted in the New Testament, there's an application made. There's a reason for it, see? There's a reason. And there's no higher, greater uh, understanding of the Old Testament than to let the, let the New Testament quote it and let the Holy Ghost quote it. Then he's the one who wrote it and let him tell you what he did it for. In Matthew chapter 13, verse number 14. It's quite remarkable when you look at this. Here's what he said, Matthew 13, 14. And in them is fulfilled the prophecy of Esaias, which is Isaiah, which saith, By hearing ye shall hear, and shall not understand, and seeing ye shall see, and shall not perceive. For this people's heart is waxed gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes they have closed, lest at any time they should see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, and should be converted, and I should heal them. All right, let's look at it just on the simple surface of it. What's it say? What's it saying? It's saying that I have closed their eyes, shut their ears, hardened their heart, so they cannot believe. Is that what he said? That's what he said. Less seeing, and should be converted, and I should heal them. I did this so they won't be. Now immediately you should say to yourself, what is going on, right? That's how you study the Bible. And that's how the scripture opens up to you. Why would he shut someone down so they could not be converted? He does it to protect them. This is why he blinded them. And this is what Romans chapter number 11 is talking about. That they, for the gospel's sake, they're your enemies. But for the elect's sake, they're beloved of God. Amen. Hath God cast away his people. Now here's what he says. Because in Matthew chapter number 12, here's what Bullinger says, and I think he's got a good note on this. In Matthew chapter number 12, right before this, this quotation, Matthew chapter number 12 and verse number 14. Then the Pharisees went out and held a council against him, how they might destroy him. See that? And so in the 13th chapter of Matthew once he starts the parables, he tells them, he's quoting Isaiah 6, and Bullinger says, this is as coming from Jehovah on the day a council was held to destroy him. In plain words, this is the witness of the Father to the sealing and blinding of the Jewish people. Now look at John chapter number 12 and verse number 40. John 12 and verse 40. Now if you look at verse number 37, though he had done so many miracles before them, yet they believed not that the saying of Esaias the prophet might be fulfilled, which he spake, Lord, who hath believed our report, and to whom hath the arm of the Lord been revealed. Therefore they could not believe, because that Isaiah said again, he hath blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts that they should not see with their eyes nor understand with their hearts and be converted and I should heal them. These things, now look at this, said Isaiah, Esaias, 
when he saw what? His glory and spake of him. When did he see his glory? Isaiah 6, he saw the Lord Jesus high and lifted up. So the first application he makes when they choose to destroy Christ comes from God the Father, Jehovah. The second application he makes when they've rejected Christ, refused to believe him, comes from the Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. That's two persons of the Blessed Trinity. You reckon the Holy Ghost has got anything to say about this? Look at Acts chapter 28. This is the kind of stuff that really fires me up because... I think to myself, I'm not so sure that, the, that, uh, that Luke, Luke wrote Acts, that uh, Luke had any, had any concept at all uh, of how this applies to, John, to Isaiah 6. Now look at, uh, look at Acts 28, verse number 25. Now if you notice, it has to do with believing. Verse number 24, some believe the things which were spoken, some believe not. Now watch this. And when they agreed not among themselves, they departed. After that Paul had spoken one word, well spake who? <laughs> we've got Jehovah the Father, we've got the Son speaking. Now who's the third one speaking? The Holy Ghost. Well spake the Holy Ghost by Isaiah the prophet unto our fathers. So we go to Isaiah chapter number 6. And we've got the Father speaking, the Son speaking, and the Holy Ghost speaking. All in that chapter, in that sixth chapter of Isaiah. Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Now I don't know what gives you, what would give more authority to anything than to have the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Say it. Right? I mean, what higher authority is that? But look what happens here. Look at it in context now. Well spake the Holy Ghost by Isaiah the prophet, Esaias the prophet, to our fathers saying, Go unto this people and say, Hearing ye shall hear and shall not understand, seeing ye shall see and not perceive. For the heart of this people is waxed gross, their ears are dull of hearing, their eyes have they closed, lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their hearts and should be converted and I should heal them. Seven times that's referred to. Be it known, now look at this, be it known therefore unto you that the salvation of God is sent unto who? The dogs, the goyim, the Gentiles. And when the Apostle Paul wrote the book of Ephesians, he said something in there that is so important. He said he made of twain one new man. He did. He said in Christ there is neither male nor female, Jew nor Greek, Bond or free. In plain words, you lose racial identification, gender identification, uh, what, what would we have here? Religious identification. All of this, you lose it in Christ because if you're in Christ, that's it. You're perfected in Christ. Amen. In the Lord Jesus Christ, you don't have a female section and a male section and a transgender bunch that don't know which side they belong to. <laughs> I don't know what they are. Uh, you know, I saw something on the news a little while ago, and it tickled me to death. These uh, middle school kids, these, these girls, uh, 13, I guess they're 13, 14, 15, you know, just growing, growing up into womanhood. They're into, into sports and all. And, it's, and sports are a good thing. Sports are a good thing, folks. It's good. And they are mad. You know what they're mad about? They're mad about some man, some boy, walking into where they're getting dressed in the dressing room and call himself a she, a transgender, they're mad about it, and good for them. <laughs> they got more sense than the principal does. They do. I'm all for them. I support them a thousand percent. Hey, a girl shouldn't have to worry about some boy standing in there when she's trying to dress. That's crazy. That's insanity. If some poor old soul out here doesn't know what they are, all right, help work with them, do something with them, but don't stick them in there with the girls. Amen. <laughs> that's, that's crazy. But here, listen to this. Be it known, therefore, unto you that the salvation of God is sent unto the Gentiles. Well, was it sent to them before? Did he not say, go to the house of Cornelius? Sure he did. But you see, this is a general declaration. This is a direction of direction. See, this is the direct. This is the, this is the direction it's headed now. 
It's no longer to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. It's no longer the kingdom of heaven. Now what is it? It is to the Gentiles. To the Jew first and also to the Greek. Jew and Gentile. Makes no difference. You read the New Testament books. You know, 12 tribes scattered abroad. Who's that to? Of course you know who it is. That's not Jew. That's not Gentiles. But it's the gospel. It's a New Testament book. So here's what we have. Sent to the Gentiles and they will hear it. And they have. And when he had said these words, the Jews departed and had great reasoning among themselves. And Paul dwelt two whole years in his own hired house and received all that came in unto him, preaching the kingdom of God, teaching those things which concerned the Lord Jesus Christ with all confidence, no man forbidding him. And this is what are, these are, he wrote while he was there what's called the prison epistles. Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and Philemon. These are prison epistles. And it's, it's important uh, because uh, it's there when he's locked up. It seems like God gives him some of the greatest revelations he gets. The book of Ephesians is heavy-duty stuff, folks. Ephesians, flipping Colossians, talking about angels, worshiping of angels. So it's a wonderful thing to understand how that the one that made all of us, before he ever made us, he already knew what he was going to do with us. Amen. You remember over there when the Apostle Paul had his mind set he was going to go to Asia. You remember that? I'm going to Asia. Acts chapter 16. When they had gone through Phrygia and the region of Galatia and were forbidden of the Holy Ghost to preach the word in Asia. After they were come to Mysia, Mysia they assayed in other words, they made plans to go to Bithynia. But the Spirit suffered them not. And they passing by Mysia came down to Troas, and the vision appeared to Paul in the night. There stood a man of Macedonia. Now where's Macedonia? Is that east or west? Macedonia is part of the European continent. All right? Philip of Macedon was the father of one of the biggest generals that ever lived. You know who he was? That's right. I knew our history professor back there. I know exactly who I'm talking about. <laughs> you better believe it. Alexander the Great. Okay? He was a Macedonian, which is, next, which is close proximity to Greece. All right? In other words, he wanted him to go west into Europe. That's where he wanted. He wanted him to go west into Europe, and that's what they did. They went west into Europe. And they carried the word of God. How many has ever looked at a map of, uh, uh, of the uh, uh, Anatolia and the, and the peninsula there with uh, Turkey? And you've got Istanbul and you've got a, I forget what, Straits of Bosphorus. I forget, I think that's what that's called. It goes into the Black Sea. Well, what you've got here, Turkey is an unusual country. The western part of Turkey is part of Europe. But the eastern part of Turkey is part of Asia. All right, so you got one country, Turkey, that's part of both. Far more of it is part of Asia than is part of Europe. But when you look at it, how many's ever heard of Hagia Sophia? Okay, well, it's, it simply means holy wisdom, and it's a church, and it is in Istanbul. It used to be Byzantium, then it was changed to Constantinople when the church eastern branch of it separated from the western part which was in Europe in Rome and they settled there in the eastern part and they called it by Byzantium or Constantinople all right well when the Ottoman Empire overthrew Constantinople they called it uh, Istanbul and that's what it's called to this day but it's quite a remarkable thing that right north because it's north of Israel if you get a map and just look north You'll see Iran over here, and you'll see Turkey up here. And that's where they went with the word of God. And they carried it from there over into Europe. Now, God had a reason for that, didn't he? Here's what he says in Revelation 3. He that openeth and no man shutteth, and shutteth and no man openeth. I know thy works. Behold, and this is to the church of Philadelphia. I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it. For thou hast a little strength, and hast kept my word, and hast not denied my name. 
That's what we should be praying for tonight, is an open door. You can't open doors. You can't make them open. I mean, as many times they've shut down the, the, the missionaries, the Boxer Rebellion. How many have ever heard of that? The Boxer Rebellion in China. Okay? All right, that took place, I think, the late latter part of the 1800s, early 19s, somewhere in there. It took place before World War I. But the Boxer Rebellion was by a group of Chinese, and their main goal was to drive Christians out of China. Get them out. Get them out. Get rid of them. I mean, they wanted to eradicate anything that named the name of Christ. Isn't that something? Look at North Korea. They catch you with a Bible. Do you know what they do to you? They will still persecute Christians, and they still kill Christians. There are places on this earth that absolutely do not want the gospel of Christ. They don't want it. They want no part of it. And they'll kill you if you try to come in there and preach the word of God and, uh, and get people saved. America was a great land at one time. The doors were opened. The people responded to the gospel. I fear what's happening to the Jew tonight and I don't know how many liberal Jews are still supporting liberalism because you're seeing the fruits of liberalism right now, folks. That's liberalism. You know, cancel culture and all that. But it's to the Jew right now. What if it turns on the Christians? You see, these Jewish students in these universities are afraid to go to school now. They're afraid. They're afraid. And that's something in America? Can you imagine America? They're afraid to go to school. That could be Christians next. Yes, it could. It could be us, in other words. It could be us next. So what's, what, what's the answer for all of this, preacher? What can we do? Even so, come, Lord Jesus. That's what we do. Pray for him to come. Father, bless your word tonight. Thank you. Time we've had together. In your holy, righteous name I pray. Amen. Amen. Pray about this situation today because I've never seen anything like it and I don't know where it's headed. I have no idea. I have no idea. It'd be interesting.